Thank you very much. If you think that learning Spanish to defend yourself from the Cubans is very difficult and it takes a long time, you're wrong. With my system, it's not difficult and you wouldn't have to spend so much time learning. Because uh, you will need only a few words, the most important ones. Now, you wouldn't have to pronounce them perfectly either. Because as long as they know what you're talking about, I don't care. For example, the word coño. <laughs> it's pronounced coño. But you'll never say it like that. You'll say coño. And the other words you would say, mire, come, mire, corral, no jodes mas, and all that. <laughs> now, I don't want you to pronounce them perfectly. In fact, I'm going to pronounce these words with the accent. I am going to pronounce them the way I think you would pronounce them, to make it easier, to make it faster. Because I think that you have to learn Spanish real fast. <laughs> I've been watching very closely what's been happening in Miami lately, and I believe that something has to be done in favor of those that can't speak Spanish in this area. <laughs> because they have to learn to defend themselves. They have to learn Spanish because they need the goddamn language. They, they need it. <laughs> it's the only language you hear everywhere. I don't care where you are. Wherever you are in Miami, there are Cubans. For example, this guy, this Cuban, is, is going to work. He's already in a car. And his wife is in the window. And they're talking. And his wife said to him, People! Acuérdate de recoger la matica en el colegio cuando salga. And people says, La guava no la trae hoy! And you're passing by, and, and, and you don't like that. You don't like that. <laughs> because you don't know what, they, what the hell they're talking about. And you have to know. Because sometimes they're talking about you, and you don't know it. <laughs> See, people's car is on reverse. And you're passing by, and you haven't seen his car. And his car is on reverse. It's going to hit you. But his wife in the window sees that. And she says, Cuidado con el americano que va para atrás! See what I mean? She saved you, and you don't know it. And, but not only that, not only that, sometimes we take advantage because since we know that you don't speak Spanish, we talk of you in front of you, <laughs> and you don't know it. Okay? You're in a place waiting for some papers or something. There's a Cuban taking care of you, and another Cuban comes in. And the other Cuban says to the one that's taking care of you, he says, ¿Qué estás haciendo? <laughs> what are you doing? And the other guy says, he says, uh, aquí está un hijo de puta este que está jodiendo esta mañana. <laughs> he called you son of a bitch and you don't know it. <laughs> now, you will notice, even if you, if you, if you look at his face trying to to guess what he's saying, you will never guess because he changes his, his expression. <laughs> like uh, he smiles when he says that to make you think that he's saying something different. <laughs> he says, aquí, aquí, con el hijo de puta Now, tell me, what would happen if you understood what they say? If right after they finish talking, you say to the guy, Mas hijo de puta eres tú. <laughs> Wouldn't that be terrific? Huh? That's why you have to learn Spanish real, real fast. You have to, you have to learn Spanish now, be, be, before you become a minority. <laughs> Now, let's go with the lessons. Lesson number one, meaning of the word come mierda. 
observe that I pronounce the word with the accent, as I told you before. This word, come me mierda, is the most beautiful word that we have. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's not a Castilian word, it's not a Spanish word, it's a Cuban word. <laughs> and we're very proud of it. <laughs> we're very proud of it. You want to call someone stupid, dull, uh, you want to tell him that he's a jerk, that he's uh, nuts, that he's a fool, just say, come mierda. <laughs> it means all that. <laughs> come mierda has so many different meanings. It's so useful. For example, he's the most stupid guy I have ever met. Es el tipo más come mierda que he conocido en mi vida. <laughs> Repeat. Es el tipo más come mierda que he conocido en mi vida. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Don't be so senseless when you talk. No seas tan come mierda cuando hablo. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now, repeat with me. I want you to practice the word because it's very important. I want you to practice it with me. When I say three, say the word. One, two, three. Come mierda. One, two, three. Come in. Yeah. Very good, very good. You're learning very fast. <laughs> to make sure that you know the meaning of the word, he is a fool. What is he? Come in. Yeah. Right. He's, he's stupid. What is he? Come in. Yeah. They gave him a check that bounced. What is he? Come in. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> Practice this word, pronounce it. Learn how to use it because if you don't, I'll have to call you. What am I going to call you? Call right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lesson number two. <laughs> Meaning of the word coño. <laughs> it's strength and many different ways of using it. Coño has no meaning in English. But once you get familiar with it and you start using it, you'll love it. <laughs> Just as much as we do. <laughs> Spells C-O-N-O. <laughs> Nye is the end with a little thing on top. And it's pronounced coño. Coño. Observe that. Coño. <laughs> now, basically, this word, coño, gives strength to whatever you're saying. <laughs> you say something without the word coño, and it's very weak. <laughs> now, when you add the word coño, it becomes stronger. <laughs> you want to say, uh, why are you so late? In Spanish, it would be, por qué llegaste tan tarde? Now, when you add the word coño to it, <laughs> it's about five times stronger. <laughs> it has more meaning. <laughs> Por qué coño llegaste tan tarde? <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> what did he say to you? In Spanish, it would be, que te dijo? Now, adding the word coño. Que coño te dijo? <laughs> What's the matter with you? It's going to be, que te pasa? Adding the word coño. Que coño te pasa? <laughs> Why don't you pay attention to me? Por que no me atiende? Adding the word coño. Por que coño no me atiende? <laughs> to express that you are happy. Uh, for example, uh, gee, I feel good. Coño, que bien me siento. <laughs> When you are mad, you're very angry. Déjeme tranquilo, coño. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> Just say something nice to a girl. Gee, what a wonderful girl. Coño, que tipo más chévere. Just say something nasty to a guy. This guy is so fat. Coño, que gordo está. 
<laughs> See, expresses everything. He has many different ways of using it. And it's, it's a very versatile word. Very versatile and very strong. This word is so strong that sometimes you don't have to say the whole sentence. <laughs> you don't even have to say the whole word. With half of it, you express everything you want. You walk into a place that doesn't smell good. You say, nah. <laughs> A beautiful girl that passes by. No. <laughs> a guy that almost got hit by a car. No. <laughs> no, since you're not familiar, since you're not familiar with the word. No, and you're not familiar with the, with the letter Ñ, I want you to say Ño with me several times to practice. Ño, 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 Ño. Very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> the word that I'm going to explain now, carajo, <laughs> It's very difficult to explain. Very difficult. I couldn't tell you what it means because it doesn't mean anything. And it means a lot. I don't think anybody could tell you what it means. Don't send anybody to El Carajo. <laughs> because that's the wrong place to go. <laughs> they say that Carajo in, in English means hell. That's wrong. <laughs> Completely wrong. Carajo is worse than hell. <laughs> I don't know where El Carajo is. <laughs> and I don't know how it looks like, but it's, it's worse than hell. <laughs> if you want to find out what I'm saying, just send someone to hell in Spanish. For example, hell in Spanish is infierno. Say to, to anyone, go to hell in, in Spanish. Say, vaya al infierno. Nothing happens. <laughs> in English, it might happen. In English, if you tell someone, go to hell, you might get in trouble. But not in Spanish. In Spanish, say, vaya al infierno. They don't even pay attention to you. <laughs> they say, who's this come mierda? <laughs> But if you send someone in Spanish to El Carajo, you're in trouble. <laughs> Try and say it. You are in trouble. So Carajo is worse than hell. Carajo doesn't mean hell. Carajo means Carajo. <laughs> it's a very versatile word, too, Carajo. Very, very versatile. You're living. But you want to make sure that they know that you are living. You're definitely living. You want them to know that you are living. In Spanish, when you say, I'm living, you say, me voy. All right. All right. But if you say, me voy para el carajo, <laughs> they know that you're living. <laughs> They're going to lose you. <laughs> you're talking of a place that is real far, a remote place. It's very, very far from where you are. If you want them to know that the place is real far, say, Eso está en casa del carajo. <laughs> Repeat, Eso está en casa del carajo. <laughs> very good. You're very tired. Estoy más cansado que el carajo. <laughs> you don't care. A mí que carajo me importa. <laughs> A beautiful girl. Una chiquilla más linda que el carajo. And this sentence that I'm going to say now, this, this is the one I love. This, I use this one very much. You are in a conversation, and someone interrupts. Just say, ¿Quién carajo le dio vela en este entierro? <laughs> Repeat, ¿Quién carajo le dio vela en este entierro? Which means in English, who carajo gave you a candle in this burial? <laughs> And that's all. Váyanse todos para el carajo.
Lesson number four, this is number four. <laughs> I want to teach you some expressions that you may need. These expressions are the following. You spoiled it. La cagaste. <laughs> You're nothing but an old maid. Eres una vieja cagalitrosa. <laughs> She's quite a girl. Es una tipa del culín culán. <laughs> you look very inexpressive. Qué cara de mierda tienes. <laughs> Things didn't work the way you wanted. Te cogiste el culo con la fuerza. <laughs> Repeat. Te cogiste el culo con la fuerza. Very good. Very good. Now, this is very important. What I'm going to say now is very important. When you are among Cubans, never admit that you don't speak Spanish. I mean, you can say that you don't speak Spanish, but don't admit that you don't understand. Say, no hablo, pero entiendo el toro. <laughs> because this son of a bitch are going to talk, you know, when they talk, they'll be careful. <laughs> so in front of you, they think that you understand what they're saying. So they're going to be careful. <laughs> they say something about you. If you say that you understand everything, that's very important. I want you to remember that. <laughs> now, here are some situations that you might have to face an American girl in an elevator. The two Cuban girls talk in Spanish there. <laughs> they met at the elevator and they talk in Spanish. They don't care whether you are there. Well, they talk in Spanish. And one and one said to the other, Muchacha, si tuve la cara que puso cuando me vio. Dice, la ¿qué te dijo? Dices, nada, muchacha, que me va a decir. Se quedó. Yo quisiera que tú le hubieras visto la cara. Ya coño, como hubiera gustado estar allí, chica, para verla. Así que no te dijo nada. Dice, nada. Cuando le dije, mira acá, chica, tú no eres Olguita, la que estaba casada con Juan Carlos. Let them talk. Don't say anything. Now, when the elevator gets to your floor, get out of the elevator saying, qué mala educación, coño, gritonas de mierda. When you answer the phone, usually, you say, when there is a Cuban on the other side of the line, you say, uh, burn number. And the Cuban says, uh, con bed toy, my <laughs> And you say, run number. And the guy calls again and says, Ponme con bed toy, my <laughs> And you say, run number. But don't keep on saying wrong number constantly. If he keeps on talking, if he calls again, and says, Ponga con bed toy, my phone. Say, mark it bien, come mierda, no jore más. <laughs> now, for a young man, I've seen this many times at many places. A young American guy is with a young Cuban girl, and a young Cuban boy comes. This young Cuban boy speaks English just as well as Spanish. When he gets there, he starts talking Spanish to her. He doesn't speak English, just Spanish. He says to her, he says, he says Vivian, ¿qué tiempo hacía que no te veía, chica? And the girl, you know, she doesn't want you to feel bad. She says to him, he says, well, you know, and he keeps on talking Spanish. She said to her, he says, Pero hace como un año que no te veía, muchacha, pero vi bien, has bajado. Has bajado una pila libre. ¿Tú sabes dónde estuvimos el otro día? En casa de Raquel, chica. And she doesn't want you to feel bad, and she says, uh, not kidding. There's <laughs> nothing she can do. And he keeps on talking Spanish. And he says to her, Todo el mundo estaba hablando de ti, muchacha. Todo el mundo decía, coño, si mi vida estuviera aquí. <laughs> now, first, to let him know that you are there, just do this. <laughs> but he doesn't care. If he keeps on talking Spanish, 
and I know the son of a bitch will, <laughs> step in the middle of both and say, Está bueno ya, coño, no ven que no entiendo. <laughs> and that's all. These two guys meet on the street, and one says to the other, he says, uh, what's the matter with you? He says, I'm, I'm, I'm coming from the racetrack. He says, well, what happened? I lost everything I had. I bet everything I had in one horse. I have, I have faith in the horse, horse won my fight. I bet everything I had in the pocket and everything I had in the bank. I bet my house. And my farm, you know I have a farm? I bet my farm, too. And I lost everything. Horse number five, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget the number, I'll never forget the horse. And he came last. <laughs> and the other guy says, if that happens to me, I eat my ball. <laughs> <laughs> I already follow one, I'm doing the other one. This guy used to go to church every day and ask for a truck full of shit. <laughs> every day. Knelt down and, will you please, he, he asked his uh, favorite saint, bring me a truck full of shit, please. <laughs> every day, every day, a truck full of shit. And one day, he was asking for the truck full of shit and, and there was a guy near. And the guy said to him, he says, uh, what are you asking for? A truck full of shit? <laughs> yeah. But what do you want that for? He says, what do I want it for? If he brings me a truck full of shit, I throw the shit away and I sell the truck. <laughs> <laughs> this lady went to the doctor with a little boy about four or five months old. The boy was very weak, very sick. He was very sick, pale. And the doctors started to examine the boy, and he, he says to the uh, mother, he says, uh, take your clothes off. <laughs> but she didn't take her clothes off. And he kept on examining the boy and said to her, he says, uh, lady, I told you to take your clothes off. <laughs> she says, no, there's nothing wrong with me, doctor. I came because I want you to see the, the boy. He's the one that's sick. He says, no, no, no. Take your clothes off and, le and let's make another one. We have to throw this one away. This is no good. <laughs> One guy said to another, he says, you've been to Mexico many times. Did you ever meet Pancho Villa? He says, if I met Pancho Villa? <laughs> Let me tell you a short story. Once I was in Tijuana, drinking water in the river. And uh, I heard noise. I turned around and I saw a white horse. And there was a man on the horse. This man had a big mustache and a big hat. And it looked like Pancho Villa, and I said, I said to myself, this has to be Pancho Villa. And I asked the man, I says, Mr., are you Pancho Villa? Are you Mr. Pancho Villa? He says, yes, I am. At that moment, his horse was taking a shit. <laughs> and he said to me, he says, uh, eat it. I says, what do you mean? I says, <laughs> he says, eat it. And he had his rifle in his hand, pointing at my head. He said to me, come on, eat it. And I had to eat it. <laughs> I ate the first one, and uh, when I was going to eat the second one, came a thunder, a big thunder, came, Roar! and his horse jumped, and he fell on the floor, and his rifle was next to me, and I grabbed the rifle, and I pointed at his head. And I said to him, Mr. Villa, you are the one who's going to eat it now. <laughs> and he had to eat it. 
and you're asking me if I ever met Pancho Villa? <laughs> Pancho Villa and I had lunch together in Tijuana. <laughs> This guy wanted to sell his car, but his car was very old and the mileage was very high. And he said to his friend, says, I can sell it. I can sell my car. Because every time uh, I try to sell it, they look at the mileage and they see 145,000 miles. And they offer me, you know, shit, or, or they don't want to buy it. And his friend said, so one, why don't you reduce the uh, mileage? Says, what do you mean reduce it? Yeah, you can reduce it. Can I reduce it? Well, not you, because you don't know, but a lot of people do it. You want to reduce that mileage? Says, of course I want. He says, well, go and see this guy and give him an address. Tell this guy that I sent you and tell him to reduce that mileage for you. And you see. A month later, they meet. And uh, the guy said to him, he says, uh, did you see the guy that I told you? He says, I saw him. He says, what happened? That man is a genius man. <laughs> With a screwdriver. He reduced that mileage from 145,000 miles that he had to 15,000 miles. He says, and you sold it. He says, sell it now with 15,000 miles, you crazy? <laughs> <coughs> this guy goes to a drugstore and says to the man there, he says, give me a, a box of Tampax, please. So the man says, we don't have Tampax. We have something similar. He says, no, give me Tampax because uh, Tampax is what they recommended uh, for this cold that I have. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you mean for a cold? Tampax not for that. Tampax is for something different. I mean, you might want contact. <laughs> he says, that's right. And then the man explained to him what Tampax was for. And he says, no wonder it was so hard to swallow. <laughs> this American guy is at the United Nations, and he meets a communist from Cuba. And the American guy says to him, he says, the only country in the world where I really feel free, it's the United States. And the Cuban guy says, you're wrong. He says, you believe there is no freedom in Cuba? <laughs> the American guy laughed. He says, listen, we have freedom in Cuba. And the American guy says, look, you don't know what freedom is. You know what freedom is? Me, a simple man, I can go to the White House in Washington, see Mr. Ronald W. Reagan, secretary. I can speak to Mr. Ronald W. Reagan's secretary and ask her for an appointment with Mr. Ronald W. Reagan. Mr. Ronald W. Reagan's secretary will give me an appointment with Mr. Ronald W. Reagan. <laughs> I can go to the White House. I can see Mr. Ronald W. Reagan. I can stand in front of Mr. Ronald W. Reagan and tell Mr. Ronald W. Reagan everything I think of Mr. Ronald W. Reagan. <laughs> the Cuban guy says, well, that's nothing. In Cuba, I can go to Mr. Fidel Castro's office. I can ask Mr. Fidel Castro's secretary for an appointment with Mr. Fidel Castro. Mr. Fidel Castro's secretary will give me an appointment with Mr. Fidel Castro. <laughs> and next day, I can go there and meet Mr. Fidel Castro and stand in front of Mr. Fidel Castro and tell Mr. Fidel Castro anything I think of Mr. Ronald W. <laughs> Reagan. <laughs> that day, the lion was very nasty. Every animal he saw, he asked the same question. Who's the king of the jungle? There came a giraffe, and he says to the giraffe, Who's the king of the jungle? And the giraffe, yeah, you know, anyone in trouble. So the giraffe said, well, you're the king of the jungle, Mr. Mr. Lion. Then a monkey came and says, and says to the monkey, says, who's the king of the jungle? And the, and the monkey says, you're the king of the jungle, Mr. Lion. Then a zebra came and says to the zebra, who's the king of the jungle? And the zebra says, you are the king of the jungle, Mr. Lion. 
And then an elephant came. And the lion asked the uh, elephant, he says, Who's the king of the jungle? And the elephant grabbed him by the tail and with him hit a tree. Run and hit another tree. Run and hit the floor. Run and step on his head. Run and run. And the lion says, God damn it, if you don't know the answer, you don't have to be so fucking <laughs> mad. This guy had an accident. He had fractures all over his face. And uh, after the operation, he couldn't open his mouth. He had wires all over. And he, he couldn't open his mouth. His mouth was like this. And uh, he says to, to, to the doctor, he says, how long do I have to be like that, doctor? I said. <laughs> and the doctor said, eight months. He says, eight months? And how am I going to feed myself without opening my mouth? He says, well, by enemas. <laughs> the uh, doctor that invented that uh, system of feeding people by enema is here in the hospital. He's coming with his assistant. And uh, you like coffee? <laughs> yes, I like coffee. So, uh, how do you like your coffee? It's very light. Very, <laughs> very, very light. So, okay, we'll give you an enema of light coffee. So a few minutes later, they came with an enema of light coffee. They get the guy ready for the uh, enema, and they, uh, they put that thing in his ass. They, uh, <laughs> huh? <coughs> and as soon as the coffee started to come out, the guy said, oh, oh, and the doctor said, what's the matter? It's too hot. He said, no, put a little sugar in it. Right? <laughs> This plane was losing altitude because it had three motors and two of the motors weren't working. Now, they had thrown out everything that was heavy, like uh, the luggage, the uh, drinks, everything that was heavy, they, they had thrown out to make the uh, plane lighter so it could gain some altitude. But it still was losing altitude. And the captain came out and explained to the passengers. He said to the passengers, according to our engineers, we have to get rid of 120 more pounds because we're still losing altitude. Two members of our crew have offered themselves to jump out of a plane to save the life of the others. But I need them for the emergency landing that we're going to make. So it will have to be one of the passengers. We'll have to throw out one of you. There were 85 passengers in the plane. 84 whites and one black. <laughs> and the 84 whites looked at the <laughs> black man. Oh, that captain was, he was mad. He said, I feel ashamed of being an American. I thought that racism was something that belonged to the past, but unfortunately still exists. I have seen how you have looked at this black gentleman thinking that he is the one that is going to be thrown out of the plane to save the life of the others. Let me tell you this. This black gentleman is not going to be the one that I'm going to throw out to save the lives of the others. The one that is going to be thrown out of the, of the plane would be the less important one it would be the less intelligent. It would be the one less useful to the country, not the one with the skin darker than the other. I am going to ask a question to every one of you, and the first one not able to answer my question will be the one. He says to one of the white passengers, says, answer this one. Tell me the name of the city that suffered the first nuclear attack. And the white guy said, Hiroshima. He says, correct. Step aside. <laughs> said to another white passenger, tell me the name of the president of the United States at that time. And the guy said, Harry S. Truman. He says, correct. And I turned to another white passenger and said, 
Tell me how many, approximately, how many Japanese died in Hiroshima? And the guy said, approximately 200,000. He says, correct. And he turned to the black man and said to him, tell me the name, addresses, and telephone number of those 200,000 <laughs> Japanese. Now, this lady's toilet was clogged. The toilet was clogged. And she was uh, looking for someone to fix it. She had called three companies. Three different companies had come, but they weren't able to make it work. It was still clogged, very clogged. So this guy came in, and uh, he said to her, where's that toilet? Uh, because I only have five minutes. She says, no, you, if you have five minutes, please, don't do anything. <laughs> because three different companies have been there, and the toilet is still clogged. He says, lady, he had, a, he had some equipment. He says, I invented this. And this thing has four speeds. I haven't used the fourth one because it's so strong. I haven't used it. There's no need to use it. Where is the toilet? Show me the toilet. So she took him to a room, and uh, she showed the toilet to him. He says, this is it. He says, OK, I'm going to use speed number two. <laughs> he covered the toilet with something and moved the needle to number two, pushed the button, and the motor started. The very weak. It was oh, oh, oh. <laughs> The lady said to him, he says, so why don't you use that famous speed that you say that you haven't used? Three different companies have been here. They, they have been working here, and they haven't done anything. He says, let me do it, because we work different than the rest of the people. You know, they all work pushing. We don't. We bring out. This is like a vacuum cleaner. This is it's like a vacuum cleaner. Le let me work. Speed number three. Let me do it, huh? Don't bother me. So I put the middle of number three, push the button, and the motor started a little stronger than before, but still not too strong. <laughs> she says, why don't you use number four, man? He says, OK, lady, you're going to be a witness of the first time that this speed is going to be used. <laughs> What, what floor is this? She says, 10th floor. 10th <laughs> floor, OK. Yeah, step aside. <laughs> so I put the little number four. He pushed the button. That motor was making noise like ah, 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 And all of a sudden, from the toilet came out a guy with glasses on and, and a newspaper in his hand. <laughs> and he said to him, he says, what are you doing here? He says, I don't know. I was taking a shit on the second floor. <laughs>